Good morning, my name is Bonnie Blamer. I'm now in my third year as a postdoc here working with Sean Brady and Ted Schultz in the entomology department. And the title of my talk today is From the Leaf Litter to the Canopy, Unraveling Insect Diversity and Evolution with Field Surveys and Phylogenomics. So I study insects because they're truly an invisible majority in all terrestrial ecosystems. About 900,000 to a million species of insects have been described. This is um, more than 50% of all eukaryotic organisms living on Earth. But extrapolations actually say that this number might be a gross underestimate. So we truly don't uh, know very, truly know very little uh, still about insect diversity. Unfortunately, a lot of this unknown diversity is already disappearing, mainly through habitat destruction, um, such as in countries that I recently worked in, Madagascar and Myanmar. So as many people here in this room would agree, I see it as part of my mission to sort of preserve this unknown biodiversity before it is lost. So within the insects, my favorite groups are the Hymenoptera, which are the ants, bees, and wasps. And I actually, mostly, uh, most of my research currently focuses on the ants, which account for about 10% of the Hymenoptera. Ants are a very uh, successful group. Uh, they occur in all uh, terrestrial habitats, from the deserts to the rainforest. And within uh, forest habitats, we can usually divide ants up and living in three distinct layers, the soil, uh, the leaf litter, and the canopy. So I have become especially interested in the forest canopy as the distinct habitat layer for ants. And uh, this is uh, really a, a still unexplored habitat, and I started uh, to assess and compare a boreal ant diversity with the leaf litter ant diversity. Please Most, the mic. Oh. Thank you. Most of this uh, field research happens in uh, Madagascar, where I collect uh, boreal ants while climbing trees. Um, and then I take these ants back to the, to the lab and um, further look at uh, the diversity and, and structure of these communities. So one of the questions that particularly interests me within this research is whether in the evolution of ants, the canopy habitat or the leaf litter habitat uh, was colonized first by ants. So within a recent project, we actually traced the evolution of a boreal lifestyle of ants, using Madagascar as an example. So we uh, reconstructed this phylogeny, uh, showing us relatedness for about 300 Malagasy ant species. And then uh, using models, we could then reconstruct the evolution of this habitat trait. And what we found was um, that actually most Malagasy ants um, have started out living on the ground and then consecutively colonized the canopy habitats. Now very recently, um, I've also had the opportunity to get involved in investigating bi insect biodiversity in yet another very poorly explored region, uh, the Tananthari region in Myanmar. Here, um, I was part of a Smithsonian team assessing insect diversity in general, so not just ants or the canopy. And here we had the main goal uh, to inform conservation decisions and habitat monitoring uh, in Myanmar. But also we wanted to preserve uh, samples and build resources for future research, both in our morphological collection here at NHB and in our genomic tissue libraries in the biorepository out at MSC. Now moving away uh, from these field surveys now, I would like to give you a brief insight into the other part of my research life when I'm not a field biologist. Here I'm actually using phylogenomic techniques to study insect biodiversity on the molecular level. Phylogenomics uh, can be understood as genome-wide targeted uh, DNA sequencing for systematic purposes. And here we currently target a group of markers called ultra-conserved elements in ants but also in bees. And I just want to here single out uh, one project that we recently started on the evolution of carpenter bees. Carpenter bees are large uh, bumblebee-like bees that can become economically important because they're wood boring, as the name implies. So what's particularly interesting about this project is that we've been successful in gathering data from very old specimens that have been sitting in our collection for up uh, to 120 years. So there is a negative correlation with age and DNA um, quality, as shown here in the lower graph, and with age and um, DNA sequence capture rate, shown here in the upper graph. But the bottom line, the main point here is that we're still getting a lot of data from these very old specimens. So to me, this project is sort of a perfect example of why our natural history collections are so valuable. For this project, we are able to entirely rely on our very own NMNH collections for these bees. We have about 200 species lined up for this project, 
and now we don't have to um, go out painstakingly recollect or uh, acquire samples from other collaborators. So to briefly uh, summarize, I've shown you some examples of my projects uh, that aim to preserve biodiversity by building our natural history collections, um, both on the specimen and the genetic level, through field surveys, mostly in understudied habitats. And then um, also how I use these novel and the historic museum collections to um, investigate and study uh, the history of this biodiversity, for example, with new phylogenomic methods. Thank you very much. And of course, I haven't uh, done all this research by myself, and here are some people that I'd like to acknowledge for these projects and also some funding sources. Uh, given that you've shown that the DNA is degrading in, your, in the museum specimens through time, do you think there's anything we should do or could do to preserve our traditional collections better as a genetic resource? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. But first of all, I should say what I didn't mention is that these bees were pinned. They were not in, in alcohol, stored in ethanol. So if you collect straight into ethanol, that's great. And then, of course, liquid nitrogen would be the, the top uh, quality, but that's, uh, that's not really possible in remote field settings. So 95% ethanol is, would be great. But these were all pinned, so they've just been dried for 125 years. Bonnie, you talked about carpenter bees, and um, I'm interested in the controlling their behavior, uh, specifically getting them out of my garage. But, um, <laughs> but I don't want to kill them. So um, what, 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 what should we do? Um, what's, uh, do you have any recommendations? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of the wrong question for me, because I'm actually not a bee expert, but an ant expert. <laughs> And I, I don't know too much about pest control in general. Um. <laughs> okay, fair enough, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have an answer maybe, to that question? <laughs> maybe fumigation um, would be made, uh, maybe uh, yeah. smoking them out. Oh, okay, would be that's a good idea. Too. We'll try that. Without. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, so the, uh, the work, the DNA work you did with, the, with these uh, specimens, how did you sample the pinned specimens? Did you take a leg or something like that? Uh, yeah, I just took uh, a leg. Of... Okay. Um, so, so actually, the point I was trying to get at is that in our traditional specimens, we now know, we have many examples, that there is, a, there is sig significant amounts of DNA preserved, and yet it's degrading on a decadal time scale. And so if we feel that they, these are important genetic resources, and as stewards of the national collections, I think there are things that we can do in many different parts of our collections to preserve the DNA. An example in insects would be for particularly important specimens, say, for example, the types of many insects, you could just go ahead and take a leg now, photograph it, and put it in liquid nitrogen so that the DNA preservation is is stopped, you know, the DNA degradation is stopped at this point. Does um, that make sense? Or? Yeah, that makes sense. That's actually, a, I mean, that's a really good idea. I think ideally, if we go on uh, sampling now, we would have two specimens, one as a voucher that we preserve <laughs> for uh, genetic, genetic purposes, and one uh, as a pin morphological voucher, right? But in the case where we just won't have one single specimen, yeah, that would be a good idea, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Because especially for insects, we always have six legs, and there are, you know, they're all the two sides are the same, so we can lose three legs, basically, and we'll still have all the morphological characters. Yeah. I mean, we, clearly we can think about how to collect better going forward, but for the historical material, we can think about how to do a better job of preserving the information content. I was just wondering how the carpenter bees were collected at, to begin with, whether they were collected in ethyl acetate or... That, yeah. and maybe that also makes a difference in regards that's to really beetles. Hard. I, want, I want to cut, cut off your question. But, um, uh, that's really hard to say because they've been collected such a long time ago and they have very little information on the pin, right? So we don't know how they were originally collected. So some samples that were very old, uh, we, we get good data from them, and some of them the same age, we don't. So there must have been some variation in how they were collected originally. 